in the Psalms we see coupling. We see different Psalms that go with different other Psalms. And this particular Psalm, 112, is often connected with 111. And there have been commentators who look at these two Psalms, 111 and 112, as a summary of what faith really is about. I was talking to somebody recently when I preached on Micah chapter 6 and said, what, it, what was the good word for you on Sunday? He said, well, we were in Micah chapter 6. And this was another minister who responded, I think the entire Old Testament can be summarized in Micah 6, 8. There are, there are all kinds of these keynote, hallmark verses that, that bring everything together. And it, for many people, the Psalms would seem to be an unexpected place to find this summation of faith. But if we take these two chapters together, 111 and 112, we see who God is and what we must do in response. We see the nature of God. That is the entire field of theology, who God is. We see it summarized in these 22 verses, or I'm sorry, 20 verses. We also see what we, who are humans, need to do in response. Now, it's interesting that these verses hold such a, a powerful place because they start out happy as the one who fears the Lord. We don't think of fear as being equated with happiness. Fear is a neurological response, something that our bodies automatically do in reaction to something else. It's a way that animals can can get that jolt of adrenaline so that if they need to, to, to flee in that whole fight or flight dilemma, they've got the added energy to get away. That's what fear does for us. Now, if their, their reaction is to fight, they've got that adrenaline for the fight as well. Why would we fear God? God loves us. God is great. God is powerful. God is the creator of all that is whether it's cold or warm. We can fear God because of who God is. And we can take that fear and turn it into respect, honor, praise, and everything that is due back to God. Psalm 112 addresses what it means to follow God. Now, in this passage and in the later service, I'm going to make a little bit more out of this, but it commends those who rise in the darkness. And in the later service, it's, it's a Scout Sunday, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Scouts and their hard work at this point. But as I was reading this verse just now, I thought about another who rose in the darkness this morning, came over, unlocked the church, and was the first to discover the heat wasn't working. And this saint of a person is now trying to figure out how to reset the furnace down in the it's not really a basement. It's more like a crawl space accessible by a ladder. Psalm 112 talks about people who work hard, not for nothing, not for no good reason, but people who work hard. Oh, that's a truck. I thought it was the furnace. <laughs> Psalm 112 talks about working for God's glory. I mean, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing others. One who came out with the flu the other day because the church was having, churches have a great week for uh, our, our uh, structural issues. We, somebody said, did you know the, um, the, the sewer people are here? Um, they called me and I said, yeah, I've been there with them on Friday. But they're people who work so hard for God's glory. And sometimes working for God's glory <coughs> isn't very glory-filled. It can be dirty, it can be ugly, it can be messy. And Psalm 112 makes a, a big point about that. But it's not just about working hard. It talks about being gracious. Psalm 112 talks about being merciful, righteous, dealing generously with other people, conducting our affairs not in our own best interest, not in the best interest of our friends, but it says, blessed are those who are happy are those who conduct their affairs with justice. 
James 2.14, many of you know that the book of James is my absolute favorite book in the Bible. It says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say that you have faith but don't have any works? Can faith save you? This is the rhetorical question James 2.14 ends with. Yes, we have a relationship with God because of our faith. But the point in James and Psalm 112 is that faithful living leads to righteous living. It leads to a life that reflects God's grace. It leads to a life that reflects God's mercy and, and produces fruit. It is because of faith that somebody comes out, even when they're not feeling great, but because they know that it's their responsibility because of the commitment they made to the church to serve on a building and grounds committee to come and check on, on what the status of the sewer system in the church or the connection is. It's faith that makes somebody come out really early every Sunday morning to unlock the building and turn the heat on and then miss out on worship because they're trying to get the heat going. Faith produces fruit. In Psalm 112, it's parallel with James in a life that means we live out what we say we believe. Now, I'm going to ask a question, and if anybody shouts out, no, I don't know what you're talking about, then my, the rest will be just, you can start thinking about this afternoon. But have you ever met somebody who doesn't make any connection between things? We all have. We've all met somebody who, you're talking to somebody, you see some issue, maybe you're talking about a, a problem that you saw in, in the news, and they, they say, you know, that's just not my problem. That doesn't have anything to do with me. I, I'm just glad that, that I, I don't have to worry about that. Stories can teach us a lot. Sometimes, <laughs> stories can teach us about lessons that God wants us to learn. So I want to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there was a mouse who was in the farmhouse looking through a little crack. And the farmer and his wife received a new package in the mail, and they opened up this package. And the farm, the mouse sort of leaned out the crack because he was excited. This could be some brilliant new morsel of food. And as they opened the package, to his horror, it was a mouse trap. <laughs> uh, yeah, he didn't laugh. This was bad news for the mouse. So he went through the farmyard, and he was proclaiming to all the other animals, they've got a mouse trap. Oh, the horror of it. Well, first he came to the chicken who said to him, you know, I'm very sorry. The, the, the chicken was, was said, you know, Mr. Mouse, I can tell this is a, a big deal to you. But really, i got to tell you, a mouse trap is no consequence to me. So I can't really be worried too much about it. Mouse continued his proclamations of horror at the sight of a mouse trap, and he came to the pig, and the pig was pretty sympathetic. But he said, "I'm so sorry. There's just nothing I can do about it. But I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you." He went on, saw the cow, and the cow was also empathized with him. "I'm so sorry, Mr. Mouse, but it really doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm a cow." The mouse trap wouldn't bother me. So the mouse, mouse returned to the house, dejected, went into his little crack in the wall, and sat down. Well, that very night, a sound went through the house of a mouse trap <laughs> snapping. The farmer's wife rushed to see what they had caught. In the darkness, she didn't see that it was a poisonous snake that had gotten caught in the mouse trap. And the snake reached out and bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital, and then she came home, but she still had a bad fever. What's the best way to treat somebody with a fever? Chicken soup. Absolutely. They saw it that way, too. <laughs> so the farmer went out to the chicken coop with a hatchet to get the key ingredient to the chicken soup. Well... The farmer's wife's sickness increased, and friends and neighbors came to visit and to sit with her. As a matter of fact, they came and they decided as she got more, she got more severe that they needed to sit with her around the clock. Well, to feed them, the farmer had no choice. And off he went to visit Mr. Pig. And those visitors enjoyed ham and bacon. 
But the farmer's wife did not get well. She died. Many people came to the funeral. In fact, so many people came, the farmer felt like he really should serve a meal that they could all sit around and remember her. And so the farmer slaughtered the cow to provide the meat for all of them. The mouse looked down it through the crack in his wall. God calls each one of us to live out a vibrant faith. A faith that means doing something. A faith that means getting involved. We're a, called to go above and beyond our call of duty sometimes. And other times we learn and grow and stretch beyond our comfort zones. God calls us to be unified together as a family, growing together, lifting up one another, reflecting this vibrant faith out into this world. As we read in Matthew chapter 5, a light shining in darkness. If you hear somebody say, you know, that's really not my problem. Realize that's how the chicken fell. That's how the paper fell. That's how the cow fell. I wonder if as we look at different duties around the church and we think about look for volunteers to serve on different committees. How many times people have said, you know, I just really don't feel called to serve on building the grounds. We discover the importance of our building the grounds on days like this. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. We live in a world that actively undercuts God's transforming power. But in Psalm 112, we see a message that is repeated over and over again in the Bible. Our calling isn't just to show up. Our calling is to grow deeper in our faith. To grow in our relationship with God. It might mean changing something. Often that begins with ourselves. It might mean going into places, stretching out, beyond our comfort zone. But the wonder of it is, and we see this in Psalm 112, God's worth it. God is the one who is powerful, who created all that is. And God is worth growth. God is worth stretching. God is worth going beyond where we are to where God wants us to be. In the midst of all of this, in the midst of whatever we encounter in our lives, God is worth our praise. And we can be assured that God is is always with us. And as I said at the start, God loves us very much. Will you bow your heads with me?